Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Bwana Yesu asifiwe. I'm feeling like I'm so far from the congregation. And the teacher in me makes me feel like coming closer to you people. So if you see me coming close, appreciate that I'm a teacher. Amen? Amen. It's indeed a privilege to stand before you this day. It's not easy to stand before a congregation that knows you. It's tough. But I thank God that today he chose me to speak to us during this evangelism Sabbath. I want to confess that I am not the best evangelist around here. Actually, when I saw in the bulletin my name reading evangelist, I was like, what? When did I become one? <laughs> and I was like, hey, I actually asked Max, why do you need to hype things this much? Because I thought it was hype. But all the same, praise the Lord. And this morning, I come to you appreciating that I'm speaking to a congregation that is living in the last days. A congregation that is living in the country of Kenya where things are not easy, where things are tough, where there are challenges and issues all around us. That even when we come on Sabbath, we are saying happy Sabbath and smiling at each other, and deep inside we are really hurting. We are saying happy Sabbath, and we are saying it because we thank God the week was, is over, because the weeks are tough. Personally, in my personal life and in our family's life, we have, ha we have had very tough weeks. And I know most of us, looking at the concerns in this church, many of our families are hurting. But I am here to say that we serve a faithful God. Amen? Yeah, in spite of what we go through, we serve a faithful God and a God who is good. This reminds me of one of the contemporary songs. I know we are not good at contemporary songs. Actually, I looked for somebody to sing this song and it was a challenge. And I want to say that the Holy Spirit did not stop inspiring people to write good songs when hymns were written. Amen? We should not just sing the songs that were written in the 18s where we are trying to look for the person. Now, what happened? Why did the person write? I think it's time we also looked and sang songs that are being written today. Amen? Songs that can inspire, inspire our young people to write songs. And I'm looking at one of these songs. It's one of the new songs around. And I'm not here to sing today. I'm here to speak. And the song is called, it's called The Goodness of God. The Goodness of God. I appreciate the Kirui family sang this song some time ago. It starts with the words, I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. All my days have been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. And then the chorus is, says, And all my life you have been faithful. Can I have a witness? All my life you have been faithful. And all my life you've been so, so good. With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Stanza 2 says, I love your voice because the Lord still speaks to us. You have led me through the fire. In the darkest night, you are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. 
and I have lived in the goodness of God. And this morning, we want to acknowledge that were it not for the goodness of the Lord, we will not be here. The enemy would have destroyed us. Had he been given a chance, none of us would be here. But we praise God this morning that he has brought us to his house this day and he has a message for all of us. And I want to confess that the message may not be very popular, but it is God's word. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will minister to us. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we give glory to your holy name. We pause now to listen to you speak to us. Lord, I'm not worthy even to mention your name. And that's why I humble myself before your throne of mercy, O oh God, that please speak through me and speak to your children. I don't know the circumstances they have gone through during the week, but God, we thank you because we are here now. Please speak to us, correct us, rebuke us, guide us, and show us what you want us to learn from you this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Matthew 21, from verse 28 to verse 31. It's very easy to interchange and say Matthew 28, verse 21, because that is what we are used to when it comes to matters evangelism. But today I chose this scripture because it spoke to me. It's one of the, do I say, little or short parables of Jesus Christ? Uh, I think it is. And the title of the sermon is Yes, Sir. And I want to, to say that the scripture may not have the exact words, yes, sir, but there is an implication of that. And it says, what do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. Verse 29, I will not, he answered. But later, he changed his mind and went. Verse 30, then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Now, that's what inspired the topic of today. Yes, sir. And number two, there's something else that inspired me to say, yes, sir, is a story I read from the stories of Pastor Spurgeon. Pastor Spurgeon was the preacher of the 19th century. And he told a story about the Duke of Wellington. The Duke, Dukes are people who belong to the royal family and they are trained in military warfare, mostly. And Pastor Spurgeon says that the Duke of Wellington said to a missionary in India who was questioning whether it was of any use to preach to the Hindus. You know Hindus are idol worshippers. They are not their religion, they are deep-rooted in religion, and it has nothing to do with our God of heaven. And so this missionary thought, do I need to go and preach to the Hindus? Uh, you know, it's so easy, like us, you know, to go preach to people who are so affiliated, who have a Christian background, that when you speak to them, you say, John 3.16, chances are high they will say the words. But Hindus have nothing to do with God. And this missionary was like, I don't see the need of going to preach to the Hindus. And he said this to the Duke of Wellington. 
And then the Duke of Wellington asked him a question. What are your marching orders? What are your marching orders? And this actually is the deciding question. Who? What are your marching orders? And who has given these orders? The scripture, Jesus has given us orders that we go and preach the gospel to the whole world and make disciples of every nation. That is the second reason that made me entitle my sermon, Yes, Sir. The third one is that I work in the security sector. I'm not a uniformed person. But where I work, I deal with uniformed people. And whichever order is given, the answer is simple. Yes, sir. Yes, madam. There is no room for excuses. There is no room for, no, I think it should be like this. I think I should be like that. It is pure, simple. Yes, sir. And today, we are looking at a scripture which has that. And our Sabbath is not just about evangelism. It's also about church planting. But we may wonder, what is evangelism? What is evangelism? I don't know how many times we pause to think what evangelism is about. We may talk, evangelize, evangelize. Evangelism is very simple. Sharing the love of Jesus with the world. Sharing the love of Jesus with the people you live with. Sharing the love of Jesus with your spouse. Sharing the love of Jesus with your children. I had a statement being made by a certain couple that was being interviewed. And I've been thinking about it very deeply. And it said that couples... I know this is sensitive, and that's why I've been thinking about it very deeply. I don't know how you will take it, but it has some truth. That couples divorce when they stop being Christians to each other. Think about that. I know my husband is listening. He is here. Couples divorce when they stop being Christians to each other. And they were saying the Christian virtues are let me be kind. Be kind to one another. When we stop being kind to each other, it means we are not practicing Christianity to each other. Christianity de demands that I love you, and I love you unconditionally. Christianity demands that I treat you well. Christianity demands that I talk to you with respect. Christianity demands that I be faithful and loyal to you. And to those the issues that make us separate as families, and those the issues touch, they are the ones that make us do that. And what I'm saying is evangelism, God help us, starts if you are married with your spouse. It starts with your children. How do you treat your children? Do you show them the love of Jesus Christ? How do you treat them on a daily basis? And there are several ways of evangelizing. Number one, relationship evangelism. How do we relate in our homes with our, the people in our homes? How do you relate with that household? How do you relate with this person who works on your farm? How do you relate with your neighbors? How do you relate with your colleagues? How do you treat people? It's unfortunate that some of us, you know, the way we treat people in our places of work is so bad that they don't see Christ in us at all. And that way, we fail in our duty to evangelize. Number two, we evangelize, we evangelize by telling people, you know, with relationships, we can relate with people so well until they think there is something special about us. But there is another way of telling people about Jesus. 
And it can start as a simple conversation. You know, these days, all over you go, we are like, wa, he Kenya ni ngumu. He kono miya ruto itatumaliza. Wa. And we are talking about the bad economy, the way things are difficult. And for sure, things are difficult. But supposing we told God, things are difficult, but we have a God who is greater than the circumstances. Supposing we said, things are so bad and chances of improving are very slim. Because that is the truth. We are living in the last days. But we tell them, we have a God who knows how to take care of his own. Or do you think God feeds us because things are good? Does God feed us because things are good? Now I go to the market, potatoes that I used to buy at 200 shillings is 60 bob. But surprisingly, even when it was 200 shillings, I still ate. Because God provided for us. Let us spread, let us tell people that we have a God who cares even in these difficult times. There is hope even at this time. Number three, we can evangelize through invitation. There is hope net Africa coming up. There is come meeting coming up. There are church services which are held every Sabbath. We can do that by telling people, come and see or come and hear. Just like the Samaritan woman of John chapter 4 who said, come and see a man who has told me, who has said all things about me. Come and see a man we can invite. Number four, we can use our gifts. The book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 from verse 4 to 11 has uh, a list of the gifts that God has given the church. And when I think of that, the gifts, there are so many of us in our, in our inverse class. Inverse class is the Sabbath school class that um, members are students, are college students. And we are not doing the lesson you people are doing. We are doing the book of Leviticus. And today we were talking about how priests were being consecrated for God's work. And we realize that all of us now are priests. We saw that priests were called by God or were chosen by God. The house of Levi was chosen by God so that it can be a connection between man and God. They were to stand in for man and they were also to stand in for the people. When the people needed an advocate, the priests were to be the advocates. When God needed an advocate, the priest was the advocate. And it goes further to tell us that the, in the book, book of 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5 and verse 9, that who are we? Who are we? Who are we, church? A royal priesthood. A what else? Chosen generation. And what are we to do? What are we to proclaim? The praises of one who called us. And we saw that all of us are involved in God's work. And even as we continue saying, get involved, get involved. We have been called by God. In that lesson also, we learned that in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, that we are Christ's ambassadors who have been called, who are here on earth so that we plead with men, all please men, be reconciled with Jesus Christ. And that is basically what evangelism is about. Telling people about the love of Christ and telling them it's time to get reconciled with God. That's our work as Christians and as priests in the household of faith. And we use our gifts. Some of us are called to be teachers. Some of us are called to be music ministers. Some of us are called to be preachers. Some of us are called to be evangelists, apostles. So many gifts in this church that if each one of us was to go out and use our gifts, it would be so different. 
I remember the other day Pastor Kali was teaching on gift assessment. He wanted us to know our gifts. I wonder how many of us came in to know our gifts. But there are three ways we can know our gifts. Number one, I had this from somewhere. Affinity. 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 What is it that you like doing? What is it that you like doing? There are some of us who I walk around, I sing. In the bathroom, I'll sing. Anywhere, I will sing. Affinity. You find it so easy to, to, to sing. Number two, ability. Are you able to do what you like doing? Uh, there are some of us who will want to do things, but the things are so hard for us because that is not us. There are some of us, you ask them to come and stand in front here. Not that I'm courageous. I'm standing here by the grace of God. But there are some of us who even coming to stand here is so difficult. Ability. But there is something that those people can do. And number three, opportunity. There is affinity, ability, and opportunity. When opportunities arise, do you take advantage of them? Do you take advantage of them? If you are gift, you can easily know, I like singing. And I have that ability to sing. And any opportunity given to me, I will sing. That is how you discover your gift. Please, those of us who are still wondering, let us look at that. See what we like to do. See what we are able to do. See what comes to us naturally. And ask God to help us use that for his glory. Amen? Amen. Then number four, we pray for souls. We can invite people. We can use our gifts. We can tell them. We can relate with them. But only the Holy Spirit of God that is able to convert. And brothers and sisters, this is something the church must do. I know we, 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 like, we like saying, I am praying for you. I am praying for you. Let us do the actual praying. Pray for souls. Plead with Jesus. Please give us souls for your kingdom. When you go to some place and you are ministering, give souls. Pray for souls. Pray for your brothers and sisters. Pray for your family members who are not yet saved, that they get so saved. Now I'm bringing it home. Did you know the Adventist church exists for mission? Did you know each department in this church is designed for mission? Did you know that even that Sabbath school class is designed for mission? Let us reflect. How many heads of departments do we have in this church? Let me see the heads of departments in the congregation. Heads of departments. Okay, thank you. I see many heads of departments. And I want us to reflect this morning. We have said that department exists for mission. The whole idea of having your department is so that you can evangelize. All of us are members of departments. Some of us are active members. Some of us don't really care. We don't really care. But whatever department, let's say, let me take women ministries. Women ministries department. Every lady in this church belongs to the women ministry. Whether you are active or not, that's where you belong. And I want to ask a question. To the, leader, to the leaders and to the ladies themselves. How much have you been involved in mission this year? How many of your activities have been geared towards evangelism? There are some of our departments, we only hear them when there is like a retreat somewhere. But even in a retreat, is that retreat geared towards mission? And as, the, as Elder Chief asked the ambassadors, when you bring 
to the, uh, to the pastor or to the elders council that you want to have a social Sunday. What does that social Sunday got to do with the three angels' message? We are not saying you don't go for, please go for social Sunday and enjoy. But make sure whatever you do is geared towards evangelism. There are so many evangelism opportunities. But most of us are comfortable coming to church. New Life Church. Have you ever been to New Life? Yes. And we sing what a fellowship, what a joy divine. And we feel very, very nice. Yes, we are a family. Brothers and sisters enjoying the warmth of new life while souls out there are dying. Brothers and sisters, this is a serious matter. We ask, who is going to Kajiado? You get 10 people going. And we are hundreds or even thousands of us seated here. It is sad. It is serious. And we are saying that Jesus is coming again. How does he come again while we are seated here? Who do you expect should go and tell the world about the love of Jesus? It's a serious question. How are you involved in telling the world about the love of Jesus? What a fellowship, what a joy divine. It's good to have fellowship, but we are called for more than that. We are called for more than that, church. It is not about what a fellowship and hugging each other, saying happy Sabbath while the souls of men are dying. We are fast at saying, you know, there, there's this statement we love, and it's in, we like saying it. There are some friends of mine, Sarah Oswago being, being one of them. There is this statement in the hymn, Hug the Voice of Jesus Calling. And there is this verse, Kwa sala na kwa sadaka. You know, with your prayers and with your bounties. And most of us love that. I wonder how much we pray. I wonder how much we give. But ask yourselves, supposing the early Adventists gave offerings and sat. They never went anywhere. Supposing the early missionaries stayed in America or in Europe and never came to Africa. Would we have gotten the gospel? So you don't just sit and say, with my prayers and with your bounties, I can do what heaven demands. We need people to go. We need people to literally leave their comfort zones and go and tell the world that time is running out. I want us to look at Luke chapter, chapter 10, verse 2. Luke chapter 10, verse 2 is a very interesting book. And uh, somebody shared with us last Sunday. We were somewhere with Hope Okenye and, and some other people. And uh, this person shared with us from Luke chapter 10. A very, a very, it's a scripture we know. When God was sending out the 72, two by two, other scriptures 70, other scriptures 70. But they were being sent two by two. And there is power in sending two by two. It simply means you can move in small groups. You don't need to move at the whole of New Life Congregation. You can form small groups. I like the way the direction the general conference is taking. It is saying form small groups and use the small groups for mission. Supposing we are so many of us in this church, let me estimate we are like 1,500 seated here. Supposing we formed small groups of 10 people for mission, how many groups would that be? 150 groups. Imagine the impact they would have. And Jesus is here sending out the 72, two by two. And there is um, it's Luke chapter 10, verse 2. He told them, let's start from verse 1. After this, the Lord appointed 72, 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. 
He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. But the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers. He told the, disciple, the, 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 the disciples who he was, pray, make a prayer that the Lord sends out reapers. God considers the laborers first. Did he tell them, go and look for money to go for mission? Did, they tell him that? Did he tell them that? Go and pray for money. Of course, money is needed and we can't do mission without money. But the first thing Jesus is saying, tell the Lord of harvest, ask the Lord of harvest to send for reapers. And we always sing, Lord of harvest, send for reapers. Don't we sing that? Have we ever thought that we are the, 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 the reapers that we should, who should be sent? We want God to send other people except me. I'm just saying, send John, James, Alice, Jackson, but not me, Sarah. Send for the reapers. It is time we said, God, it is us, the laborers. It is time we said, yes, sir, it is me. And not the yes, sir, that we read in the scripture. He said, yes, sir, I will go. And he never went. It is yes, sir, and we obey the voice of God. Now, New Life Church has been to missions. And missions are interesting. And I want, don't want you to think that I'm limiting missions to Kinakajiado. Even missions to the prisons. They are very interesting and very inspiring. And as a church, we've gone to missions and we have planted churches. I remember missions experiences are very nice. I remember there is a mission we went to long ago in 2006 there in a place called Chevaluki Nukambani. And this was a very interesting mission in that it was organized by a small singing group which was then in this church. And my family, we were young families with children who were young. So if you have young children, please don't say that you can't do anything for God. Don't say you can't go even for missions. And I remember this mission and we, we went there and we saw, you know, the power of God in real action. You know, when you go out into the field is when you see the power of God and you see that the book of Acts of Apostles is still real. And there's this time we, we went to Ukambani. And it was interesting, we'd go with our young children. Imagine, like my family went with a 10-year-old and a 5-year-old for mission. And we were going there and we had, <laughs> it was tough, eh? We had mattresses, but we reserved the mattresses for the guest choir. And so I am seeing what the people who are in that mission laughing. The mattresses were reserved for the guest choir. And so we would put cartons on the floor, get into a sleeping bag, and sleep. And I remember my husband and Philip were sleeping. Can you imagine you are there with your son, a whole man who has gone to school and who is working with a five-year-old son on, lying on a carton on the floor in the name of mission. That is what mission does to you. It humbles you. It makes you know that it's not about the comforts of this world. It's about God. Because our lives are about God. Amen? And that mission gave us a very special experience. In that area, there used to be a shrine of where witch doctors used to carry their activities. And this shrine was just next to where we were staying. And so as choirs wanted to practice, they would go and stand on that shrine, you know? And people in the village would look at us and wonder, what kind of people are these who are standing on a shrine and just singing and nothing is happening to them? And there's this day 
that just when the service, the program was beginning, somebody came with a chicken. Somebody came with a chicken and tied this chicken to the pole. You see, you've raised the dias up. The dias is up and there are poles. And he tied the chicken down there. And the chicken was there. And he did that just when the time the preacher was about to preach. To some of us in our ignorance, we thought, hey, who jama meleta kuku kwa soko? And we were there. But those who knew what was going on started praying. They, know, they knew that war had been declared. The enemy was just not sitting pretty. He was ready to fight to the end. And the chicken was there. And the preacher got to the pulpit. And he preached. And he preached. And that day, there was an unusual attendance in the crusade. You know, like people are all over. There were so many people attending the crusade that day. And the preacher preached. And he really preached. And he even preached, you know, when you know that a place has a certain weakness. You know, like where I come from, I am born from, uh, I was born in Central Province. And if you are preaching in Central Province, it makes a lot of sense to tell people that when they have Christ, they have to do without drinking. See, that is the main problem in Central now. Ulevi, Sindio. You must tell them, God is able to change them. And so the preacher preached even against witchcraft. And he really preached. And it was time to make an altar call. And when he made the altar call, so many people came to the front. You know, ordinarily, people would come one, two, three. But that day, many, many people came. And then as people came, the guy who had tied the chicken removed his chicken and disappeared. You know what that was? The chicken was witchcraft. And it was said there so that when the preacher got to the pulpit, he would collapse and die. So, so many people were there to witness if this preacher would die. And when he didn't die, and a call was made, they came. And we saw the power of God live. And among the people who came was a young man who was a witch doctor himself. And he had dreads. He was alikuwa naitwa daktari. And people are like, le umpaka daktari ameenda. And the daktari came. And he got saved. And later that day, we went and burnt all those things he was using for witchcraft. And I want to say that this young daktari is among the people who were baptized. At the end of crusade, over 200 people were baptized, such that that church could not become a Sabbath school. It was completely new, fresh, with no old member, like it was like Kinakamukuru. No old member. Everybody is new. And this doctor is still in the church. By God's grace, he was still unmarried. He found another lady there in church, and they were dead in church. Amen? So we go out for missions and see God at work. God is there to use his children. And when I hear, hear us imagine saying that in the Adventist church we don't experience miracles. We do. It's only that we don't notice them. Or we don't avail ourselves where miracles are taking place. If you don't avail yourself where miracles are taking place, you won't see them. And I pray that as we continue doing missions, we keep, we keep seeing miracles happen. I remember this time we went with the children to, to the Raka on mission. And it was during the rainy season. And we'd see, you know, it would rain in the afternoons, in the late, in the evenings there. And I remember that this day we went for the crusade. And we saw that rain was coming. And the programs would not run with the rains. And we had children divided in groups praying. And children would pray in, on their, in their groups. And they told God, God, please stop the rain until we finish. God, stop the rain until we finish. I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, 
It rained all around us. But in the shopping center where, where we were preaching, not a drop came. And by the time we were going home, it started raining. Isn't God faithful? And he answered the prayers of small children. I remember when we went to Matu. On the first day, our bus, this marine bus, got stuck. And it dug itself so deep that it could not come out. We tried pulling it with a tractor. You know, first we tried pushing. It could not move. It stuck even deeper. And we tried all things. And I remember all the children were, would do was to worship. They sang all the worship songs they knew. I can't remember the children worshiping. And at last the bus came out. We have seen miracles when we go for missions, brothers and sisters. But my question is, how involved are you in God's work? How are you involved in, you involved in God's work? I know that time is moving and I would like to dash towards the finish. But I want to appreciate that when we go out for, when that evangelism is not an event, it's a process. What did I say? Evangelism is not a? What is it? Yes, it is a process. It's not something that happens, pop, and then you go away and it's over and you are like, we have evangelized. There is, let's take for example mission. Uh, when we went to Kajado last year, before we went for the mission, we had some people who went a month earlier to prepare souls for what was coming. We notice in Luke chapter 10 verse 2, that verse 1, that Jesus sent the 72 to go before them into the cities he was to go. So in short, he had sent forerunners. And in our missions, last, like, like last year, we've had our global pioneers, the ones who were introduced, being the forerunners of our mission. They were to go and prepare the ground and tell the people, hey, something good is coming up. Something good is going to happen in this area. That is phase one of evangelism, of missions. And then there is the mission itself where I've shared with you the great things that God does in missions. And the greatest thing is that he converts soul for the kingdom. We've just talked about that doctor who accepted Jesus and is now serving the Lord, seriously serving the Lord. We have seen the lives of people being transformed. I remember in Narumoru also, we saw the lives of people being transformed during the mission is, is the second phase. And then the last phase is after the mission. And this is where we face the challenge of unfinished work. Brothers and sisters, we go preach, come back, relax. It happens like nothing went on. We preached in Kajado in December. But allow me as from the congregation. How many have ever been to those churches after December? Let me see. How many have been to our three churches after December? After December. Very few of us. Ambassadors have been there. Thank you. Church. We are so many of us. I'm sure Pastor Salash and Pastor, and Pastor Pascal are shocked that this church is this big, yet they sit in those churches of theirs, seeing none of us going to visit them. I want to use the Kajiado West because it's the most recent. We sit here Sabbath after Sabbath, feeling comfortable. I want to say, I want to say that this is different because for Matu and Kangundo, we had the youth following up. This year, even the youth have hung their boots. Young people, I'm talking to you first before I get to ask parents. You are young. You are strong. 
the gospel was preached by the disciples who were young people. They were not our age. They were your age. Young people, I'm calling upon you. Please support the work of God. You have done it so much. And for this, I'm grateful. This church is blessed. That when we call for missions, only the children and the youth go for mission. The rest of us, with our prayers and we are bounties, that is where we specialize. We sit here. We were in Kajiado in December. It is now August. I talked to the global pioneer, the, the lay preacher we left at mile 46. And he asked me, Mam Sarah, Muli Tusahau. It really pained me. Hakuna mtu amewahi kuja kutuangalia. Hata hamjui kanisa inaendeleaji. You know, do you know how much it pains? Do you know how bad it feels? Muli Tusahau. And we are the, pitch, the people who took the gospel to them. And then we walked away because we are paying people, lay preachers, and we imagine they are able to do what the rest of us could support them to. Uh, I would like Pastor Salash and Pastor Pascal to stand up. Pastor Salash and Pascal stand up. Thank you. Those are the people. Salash is in charge of Kamukuru. And Pastor Pascal is in Esonorua. They can sit down. Do you know the burden that is on those two men? These two men visit members every day of the week. These two men, because their congregations are new, are supposed to teach the members the songs. So they are the, the church trainers. These same men are supposed to teach members women ministry what women ministry is. They are supposed to be youth leaders. They are supposed to be children's teachers. They are supposed to be Sabbath superintendents. They are supposed to be all that. Do you think that is fair? Church members, have we taken time to think about the burden that is on these men? The youth leader, Please, can you go to those Sabbath schools and teach the youth there and show them what it means to be an Adventist youth? Women ministry, can you go there and teach those ladies there what it means to be an Adventist woman? Children's teachers, can you go there and train teachers on how to teach? I remember early this year, we came up with an idea of having time to go and train teachers there. Because they had come from Sunday churches and they were still to teach children. And I remember how difficult it was for us to go. It was so hard even to get funding for us to go and train teachers. It pains me. Brothers and sisters, it is painful. And I pray that God will give us a passion for souls. That when we are from mission, we will be consistent and we will visit these souls that are dying. I challenge the departments in this church. I challenge you, brothers and sisters, that it is time we took God's work seriously. Let us sacrifice. Let us sacrifice. I know sometimes it may seem like we are busy. There are many things to do. But these people need you. Your brothers and sisters in these places need you. Some of us are privileged to come from places where the Adventist church is a common church. Where I was born, you can't believe in those days we were the only Adventists in the whole sublocation. When I was growing up, we were the only people who would go to the Shamba on Sunday. On Sunday, everybody else was going to church. I think I'm so zealous for mission for having been born where the Adventist church was unknown. We were privileged or we thought we were disadvantaged because we were the only ones who did not go to church on Sunday. And some of us who are privileged to be born in places where Adventist church was commonplace take things for granted. There are so many brothers and sisters who don't have this message. Let us not enjoy sitting here, singing what a fellowship, what a joy divine. 
let us seek souls and keep them for the kingdom. There is a challenge in the Adventist church called the leaky bucket. The leaky bucket is where you baptize people and within time they keep on dropping, they keep on leaking and we are losing members and we are losing them because we are not nurturing them. The Bible in, a fish, in the book of Acts chapter 2 from verse 41 to 47 tells us how to ensure that we keep people in the faith we must continue teaching them. Acts chapter 2 verse 41 to 47. We must have habitual fellowship in Acts chapter 2 verse 46. We must have habitual breaking of bread. These days the young people call it swallowship. We must spend time to eat together. And we must develop leaders. We must develop leaders. And that's why I'm inviting the church to join our lay preachers in developing the leaders for the church. We must participate in training children's teachers. We must participate in training Sabbath school teachers. And I want to say that those churches have never seen lessons. I remember the other day we went with my husband to those churches. And that was the first time we took lessons to them. They were seeing lessons for the first time. Brothers and sisters, things are serious. We must spend time. We must sacrifice. I want to say that Kajado West is only two and a half hours from this pulpit. You'll go and come back. You don't need to spend there. We can't afford to be seated here day in, day out and do nothing. We must ensure that the church grows. And as we go back to our scripture reading, I want us to go back to our scripture reading as I finish. We see this person, this first son, who said to the father, the father represents God. The sons represent, the first son represented the, the Jews. And the second son represented the Gentiles. But in this case, we are the sons. And the vineyard is the people of God who need to be reached. And God is telling us, go and work in my vineyard today. And mostly we are like the first son. We say, yes, sir. But our yes, sir, does not translate to actions. Our yes, sir, ends there and we go and do our bit. Neither do I want us to tell God no. It's bad manners to say no to the authority. But I want us to say yes, sir, when we really need it. I want us to say yes, sir, to using our gifts for mission. I want us to say yes, sir, to going to those hospitals. The hospital ministry is calling for workers. I want us to say yes, sir, to go to the prisons. Yes, sir, to go to our schools. Yes, sir, to go to the children in our communities. Yes, sir, to the voice of God that we are going to serve him. I want us to think of opportunities where we can have small groups doing all these missions. There is so much work out there to be done and we cannot do it as long as we continue to sit here. We need to give our prayers. We need to pray. We need to give our bounties, but we must use our feet to get to those people. We thank God there is, there is digital evangelism. Some of us young people are so good in sending things on TikTok. Can we do that for the glory of God? There are so many ways, so many opportunities. And I request that we say, yes, sir. And we keep the promise. When we say, yes, sir, we stick to what we have said. It is a joy to serve the Lord. You know, sometimes we look at people who are so busy in missions and you wonder, don't they have something to do? They have a lot to do. But the main thing for them also is mission. 
with the gifts God has given us. Let us go and tell the world that Jesus loves them. And Jesus is looking for them. He's looking for people who are ready to inherit the mansion he has prepared for us. And this afternoon I want to say it's a joy to serve the Lord. And I have tasted it. The longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. And I want you to taste and see that the Lord is good. And he'll taste sweeter when we are ready to serve him.